Hello, everyone. Thanks again for another great week of discussion during week two, where we took a look at organizational culture and spent some time discussing the power culture, the person culture, the task culture, and the role culture. Uh, as one of you pointed out, these categories are more than 40 years old, but they're still applicable to organizations today. You can still see how these ways of thinking influence organizations in our time and how they shape the way decisions are made, the way communication happens, the way that business plans are pursued. I think the, the takeaway for, from this week is that these cultures influence the way things happen kind of uh, almost on a subconscious level. Most people don't walk into work saying, okay, this is a role culture that I'm dealing with today, so I need to think about that and see how that's going to influence what I do and how I speak and how I send my emails. Most of us don't think that way. The, the influence is, is kind of behind the scenes, kind of below the surface. But once you realize that these, that these frameworks are operative in your organization, it can help you to respond in ways that are more productive. For example, if you know that you're dealing with a power culture, that you're dealing with somebody who is the leader, and that's the person that controls the communication and makes most of the decisions, if you know that that's the way the organization is run, you can adjust how you act. You can adjust how you, how you um, give feedback based on, based on that reality. Uh, another thing that uh, several of you pointed out too is that although it's easy to point out some of the negatives on all of these cultures. They also do have some positive aspects and depending on the context that, uh, that the organization is operating in, depending on the size of the organization, where in um, the organizational life cycle uh, a company is, that different cultures uh, have, you know, some of them some have some advantages and, uh, you know, for example, a really large organization almost has to be a role culture. If you have tens of thousands of employees spread out all over the world, uh, performing different uh, functions and uh, you know, in in different in different geographical locations, you need you need a role culture in order to make something that big function. You have to have interchangeability of of people in different positions. You have to have the the uh, respect for the role because you're going to have new people moving in and out it can't just be person related uh because it's just too big you can't know everybody um so i think that's that's important to to recognize that each of these cultures does have um does have some positive aspects to it as well as the as well as the negative aspects that that many of you pointed out so looking forward to uh, to next week. Oh, before we go to next week, um, one of the other things that we really didn't talk about this week but was in the reading was leadership coaching and mentoring. And I, I think of those as two very helpful tools that we can use as we develop as, as leaders, uh, but they're definitely distinct. They're definitely two different things. The way that I look at it is a mentor, somebody who is a mentor is somebody who's in the same um, in the same kind of business or the same uh, the same kind of role that I'm in, who's been at it for a longer period of time, who's a little further down the road in their professional development. So, for example, uh, people that have been teaching at Baypath longer than I have, I look to them as mentors. So somebody like uh, Rima Dale, who teaches in the uh, graduate school in nonprofit management, she was one of my professors when I when I studied at, at Bay Path back in the early 2000s. I look to her as somebody who's she's done this longer than I have. She has a lot of experience. She has a lot of skills. She can help me develop because she's been there and done that. A leadership coach, on the other hand, isn't necessarily somebody that's in the same field that I'm in. It's somebody who has coaching skills. It's somebody who could sit down and have a conversation with me and draw out from me my goals, draw out some of the challenges that I see, draw out some of the strategies that I could use to, uh, you know, to advance in my career. So 
it's a different set of skills. It's a, uh, it's the skills of a coach. It's the skills of somebody who can have that kind of relationship with you and encourage and inspire. And I think both it, it's, it's great to have both mentors and leadership coaches to help one, um, to help one grow as a, as a professional. So now next week, looking forward to week three, we'll be talking about uh, societal culture and how, how different cultures can be challenging and can uh, put challenges in the way of how we communicate in business or nonprofits or, or in education. So the, the article from The Economist is from 2012. So that might seem a little bit dated. And it's also true that the majority of the companies, of the CEOs and other uh, executives and other people of the companies that were interviewed, mainly uh, Western European. But I still think that this has some helpful, uh, some helpful insights about how what challenges businesses and or other organizations face as they're, when, they're, when they're trying to operate in a variety of countries and deal with a variety of cultures. Some of the things are pretty obvious. For example, knowing another language is huge, but some of the things are, are more subtle. It's picking up on some of the details of the culture, some of the, some of the unwritten rules that are just pervasive in places and acknowledging, acknowledging those unwritten rules and respecting people according to the way that they want and need to be respected. So I'm looking forward to uh, some of your insights uh, about dealing with people from different cultures. And uh, if there's any way that I can be helpful to you, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks.